Okay, so welcome back. Um, so the last year was quite busy. I mean, we did a lot of things. Uh, we did a lot of things regarding uh, IPOL. Um, we did a lot of things in, uh, in, in MISP. And we wanted to make a kind of recap of everything. Uh, so I don't know in the audience if you have people that are not familiar with MISP. Uh, just a side note. Uh, what is MISP? Uh, <laughs> MISP is launched nowadays. Um, so if you just look at the initial project uh, that we worked with Christoph some years ago, uh, it was basically just a small software. Uh, nowadays, it's a complete project uh, with multiple parts. Um, so to make it easier to understand, we basically separate MISP project into, I would say, four kind of pillars. Uh, obviously, one is the open source software, and that's the most important part. Uh, it, it's basically an open source project. Uh, it's a trade intelligence platform with additional software, uh, including dashboards, the expansion modules, libraries, and so on, and, and tons of other software. Um, then, on top of it, and as this thing was basically growing over time, uh, it was all the uh, knowledge and intelligence database that we have nowadays, uh, including uh, warning lists, for example, for detecting false positive. Uh, we have lists of taxonomies. Uh, we have lists of galaxies, notice lists. So. Basically, that's, that's part of the project. It's really part of the core project itself, but it's not software as this. It's basically knowledge database that you can reuse and so on. Uh, and it's, I mean, initially it was just for us, but nowadays we have seen a lot of software using it and so on. Uh, and in the past year, we did a lot of work and investment in that part. Then, over time, we have seen that there were some lack into the open standards. Uh, and they were basically fundamental things. Uh, in, in MISP itself, a lot of people were asking us to implement software that is compatible with it. Um, so we decided to document what we were doing uh, and how we do it. So basically, in the project part itself, we have the open standard. It's one of the core aspects, too. Um, and in addition to that, we have other things that are basically description of data models, like object template and so on. And on top of it, uh, we, we have basically have all the tools, documentations, training materials, and so on for the uh, intelligent and sharing aspects. So basically, what are the community doing? So what kind of information do you share? How do you share this information and stuff like that? So it's, it's basically no a part of, of the, of the MIS project. Uh, we plan to publish more and more information on that. We have a cross join, I would say, project called Cross Isaac, uh, where we basically explain uh, how we could bridge information between those information sharing communities and how to build those communities too. Um, so that's one of the goals. So when you talk about MIS nowadays, MIS is not just a software, it's basically Four pillars where we do software development, uh, database of knowledge, open standard, and uh, best practices in information sharing. So that's just a summary. For the one that doesn't know about MISP at all, uh, we do a MISP training the 17 and 18 of December in Luxembourg. Uh, there are still some seeds uh, available. Uh, so just join us and you can basically discover all the inner working of MISP itself. So, uh, write a little bit of statistics about what has been going on uh, in the MISC core, at least, over the past year. So, uh, basically, if you've been following uh, the development of MISP, you're probably going to look at uh, the number of releases here and think it's kind of a low number. So, we've kind of uh, changed pace a little bit and we're doing some larger releases less frequently than we did before. So, we're down to about one uh, release per month instead of two releases per month. Uh, with, with that said, though, we've had a lot of work done uh, on the application itself. So we had a total of th uh, over 3,300 commits uh, since exactly a year ago. So we've been quite busy and we've get, been getting a lot of contributions uh, from uh, third parties. Uh, the number of contributors to the, uh, to the core itself has grown by 34. So we're currently on 130-ish, I think, uh, overall. So these are just uh, the numbers really for the MISC core software. So this is not touching on galaxies, taxonomies, and so on. Uh, so if you would count those, the, these numbers would be much, much higher. Uh, because, uh, of, of course, very often, for example, the people that are contributing to the core, to the software part, are not, are not necessarily the same that are contributing, for example, to the galaxies, to the taxonomy definitions, and so on. So, yeah. Next so, one. So. So this is a little graphic that we uh, that Alexon maintains on the site. It's basically the GitHub uh, icon of all of the contributors. Uh, I think this is all for the core project. 
it's a pro. Right, so this is a pro for all of the projects. Uh, then, so basically, it's a nice little hall of fame that we have on, uh, on the site. So you might recognize yourself if you've contributed something to uh, Miss before. Uh, so basically, let's talk a little bit about what our objectives were and, and what we've done to achieve them over the past year. So we had some kind of overarching goals. So this is not necessarily something that's on the uh, roadmap, but more what, what we tried to achieve over the past year. One of the things that, that was probably the, big, uh, the main pillar of what we've been doing recently is to try to get people engaged with information sharing. Not necessarily people that are in the same sector of activities that we are in, but one of the things that we're trying to do is to branch out to other types of communities. We've seen that we have a direct benefit from these other types of communities sharing information back with us and for them to start sharing with each other. So our, our, our main goal with MISP is basically to, uh, to increase uh, information sharing at large, so that, uh, that should not exclude other types of organizations. One of the other things we tried to do with this was bringing these different types of sectors together. So we have an initiative called Cross ISAC uh, that we're trying to set up. The idea behind that is that we uh, what we've seen over the past few years was that there are great information sharing uh, initiatives popping up all over the world. But so one of the things that's kind of still missing is bringing these different initiatives together so that there is some exchange between these initiatives themselves. So this is something that we're trying to bootstrap. Apart from that, one of the biggest goals, I think, uh, for, for the core development at least, was to rework a lot of the internals of the code. Uh, so a lot of the things that we've built up over the years, so MISP has been, uh, the development of MISP has been ongoing for, for over six years now. That means that a lot of the, uh, the code base that we've had had, uh, had been building on top of something uh, that there was there from before over and over and over, and it kind of grew into this Frank monster. So a lot of the code has been refactored over the past six months or so. Uh, we're going to see a little bit what that actually means in a bit. Uh, another thing that is an ongoing thing since the first days, basically, of development is trying to interconnect with as many tools and formats out there. So this is a, a, a nat naturally given aspect of information sharing. You get information in, you want to use it in your various tools. You, or if you want to produce information, you might uh, uh, have a tool that is producing the information that is producing in a specific format. So that one of the things that we're trying to do is is bridge this gap with MISP and basically have a, a service converter for these various different formats. Uh, and then the other thing, and this is something that has been uh, on the rise over the past few years, is the contextualization of the data. So when we started with information sharing and, we, uh, and when uh, in its infancy of MISP, most of the information that was shared were technical indicators alone, without too much context. And one of the things that we've seen more and more in need of is to share as much context as possible. We have different types of users now than we had initially. We have uh, threat analysts that are, for example, looking into specific threat actors and their activities over a longer period of time. Uh, this requires a lot of contextualization. Another thing is accurate uh, data being fed to tools. This also requires contextualization to get the data that you're really interested in, not have false positives in there, and so on. So this is a lot of different aspects, and we've, we've been working together with quite a few organizations on, on uh, achieving this. We're going to see a little bit so what some of those efforts were in a bit. Move forward. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, with this contextualization came also the need to be able to actually make use of this knowledge. So data in itself is good to have, but being able to draw knowledge out of this data is important. And for that, we, uh, we are trying to, for example, one of the biggest ones, and I'm going to spoil the later slide with that, is um, one of the biggest frameworks that we're trying to embrace is attack. So I don't know how many people here have heard of attack. So maybe a show of hands. Okay. So quite a, quite a lot. So uh, what we feel is that for, is for technical indicators, for example, this is the way forward to, to really give context and to be able to use that context and later on when you're trying to get knowledge out of what, what uh, of the data that you're actually getting from your partners. And then another thing that we've been trying to do is visualize the data. So MISP for a very long time has been a pretty static list of, uh, uh, container for the data without being able to really interact and see what you're dealing with in a visual way. And since we're humans, we, we, we kind of like having visual images of what we're dealing with. So one of the, thing, uh, the aspects that has been improved a lot recently is basically the visualization aspect of the data. So apart from that, something that comes up over and over depending on what kind of organization is you're dealing with 
is uh, basically the issue of how to deploy MISP. So this is something that comes up very often with different operating systems, virtualization versus uh, directly hosting MISP on their host, different types of topologies and internal needs. We've been trying to make it a little bit easier with various tools that, uh, that we have out there and that have been contributed by the community. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So uh, basically, uh, one of the things that, uh, that we've been doing since we have taxonomy is basically uh, to be able to ease the sharing of information is we basically reach out to organizations, and this is partially why we do trainings, why we go to conferences and so on, is to hear from other organizations what is the type of information that you're sharing. How do you describe that information in paper format, in your legacy tools, in whatever you're using. And we're trying to be able uh, to, to give these organizations the tools and the means to, sh to use the same nomenclature when they're sharing their information. So this is where taxonomies and galaxies come in. And, and we've been uh, seeing a lot of contributions and also doing a lot of internal work on basically trying to map this to the various different organizations' needs. Uh, another thing that comes along with this is whenever we reach out to various other organizations, we get the feedback that it's great, we're sharing some information already, but we would like to share more and share things that we cannot currently share because it's out of scope for MISP. So we've been basically growing up uh, the scope of what is being shared over the years via various ways. If, you, if you've been following the development of MISP for a longer time, you've seen, for example, I think it was two years ago when financial indicators popped up, that was the biggest the first big diversion of the type of information that we're sharing. Since then, we've had a lot of these different branch outs uh, in MIS. For example, law enforcement and border control agencies have reached out to us to be able to include, for example, passenger information uh, in MIS directly. So this is something that, uh, that we've also basically built objects, uh, uh, object templates and attribute types for so that people can share different types of data that makes sense to them. So, uh, Again, this is something that is an ongoing effort and that will probably never end unless we can map everything that there is in terms of data out there, which will never happen. Uh, so if you have any ideas on, on what's missing still, let us know about it. This is a great moment for us that we are seeing this many missed users in one room. So just come to us, tell us what, what's missing for you. Uh, yeah, and then the other thing is, and this is more for the galaxy. Um. Thing that we have seen, uh, and for the taxonomies of the galaxies, what we have seen in, in the past year is a lot of people had a lot of classifications. They were in Excel sheets, uh, Word document, and so on. But the major, major problem they had is basically when you start to use it machine to machines or machine to humans, uh, you need to have a way to represent them to make them standardized and so on. And that's why we invested time in the taxonomies at, at the early beginning. And then what we discovered it's, it was the same problem for more complex data structures. And one of the Complex one initially was the thread actors, uh, things where many people have different way of doing representation of thread actors, a uh, different way of, of modeling those thread actors. So we decided to make a kind of a very generic structure, data structures, uh, called Miss Galaxies, where we could represent any kind of, of information there, uh, could be thread actors. But nowadays we have like, uh, I don't know, like 30, 30 galaxies nowadays, even more, uh, including ransomware, things that are really looking at the adversary aspect. Uh, trade actors and so on. But in addition to that, uh, we have things like, for example, preventive measures or even location specific target and stuff like that. So the model is very generic, uh, and that's what we wanted from the early beginning. Uh, for example, even the attack model from Mitre is represented as galaxy, it's just automatic translation there. But it's basically a simple model for, for creating your own data models. And if you have a complete new model for describing trade actors or activity groups, for example, Microsoft is using activity groups instead of trade actors. Uh, you can basically design those ones. And that's something that really was really useful at, at the end for promoting the fact of, of describing the same way and sharing the information. Um, and that's going back to the promotion of information sharing. That's something that we, we did for the, the past years. Uh, and this past year was very interesting because what we have seen is a lot of people are installing MISP and then, okay, what's up then? What's, what's the next step? And what we have seen is basically a system without data is basically useless. Uh, and that's why in, in MISP we have those kind of, of default feed that you can just enable, see what's going on. And the way that you promote information sharing is not basically by explaining what is information sharing, but it's to show what exactly what you, kind of information you share. And when people and organizations start to see what kind of information you share, uh, they start to uh, basically do information sharing themselves because they see the interest into it. 
Uh, and that's something that we, we try to do for the past year. Um, we, we built, so for example, the mistraining material is uh, uh, completely open source. Uh, we plan to even publish the, the way to generate the training, re, uh, training documents publicly, so that means it will be open source for even generating your own training, if you want. Uh, and that's very something that we want to, to support. And then we have a, a new project called uh, Best Practices in Trade Intelligence, where we describe what are the best practices in trade intelligence. It's not really linked to MISP itself, but it's basically just best practices. And then we make a bridge to the man user manual or to user reference when you want to use it and, and basically uh, do it. Because we have seen a lot of use cases where people were like struggling of what kind of information to share, what kind of things to do, what kind of contextualized information to add and so on. And that's basically what we, we try to do too, is basically to, to help those organizations to uh, start sharing. Uh, a lot of people were thinking that sharing was basically something with the external world, but what we have seen is a lot of, of sharing aspects and difficulties is usually even within the uh, company. Uh, or within the organization. So when an organization starts to share information, uh, you basically have all the effect of trust within the organization and so on starting to pop up. Um, so that's why we try to uh, basically come with some uh, specific uh, uh, help for the users. We, we had even some use case where uh, people came with really massive data set. So we basically changed MISP how to handle the data set. Uh, and then over time, it was basically adding, adding that. And over time, what we, we did too is uh, we did a lot of work on the compliance aspect. Um, I don't want to say this harsh work here, but GDPR. Um, that, that was one of the fundamental uh, issues for information sharing and so on. But we discovered that basically, if you read properly the GDPR, uh, it's basically a promoting angle even. Because information sharing is a security and a technical measure too. Um, and when we started to review that, we have seen some lack in the platform itself where we could improve the software uh, to basically support uh, people and to at least support compliance. And that's why we introduced the uh, notice list, uh, which is a way to um, basically warn the users if some kind of information is shared that might basically uh, it's a GDPR or basically information that we should not share and stuff like that. So notice list is really at the beginning, but this model can work for any policies, workflow that you have in your uh, company, and you can basically use that as a reference uh, for uh, basically notifying the user or the analyst when using the platforms. Yeah, that's uh, one that uh, if you have seen uh, the regular release that we did so for the past months, you have seen a lot of, of uh, uh, improvement regarding speed, scaling, and so on. Um, this one is one of the uh, major thing because scaling can be difficult. Uh, so what we, we try to do is basically we get some example, data set and so on, and we try to improve the platforms. Um, so some kind of integration that we did is basically people come to us and say, oh, guys, it's nice, MISP. I have like 60, 70 MISP in my infrastructures, uh, but I need to do like kind of sharing within the organization and so on. Could you support that? So based on that, we basically improve MISP. We integrate new functionalities, the synchronization uh, protocol and so on. Uh, for example, we completely expose from the API all the remote management of the instance. Uh, for, the, for example, the people uh, deploying MISP in a SaaS environment or in a cloud environment uh, could basically use the API easily and updating the uh, MISP instances. This was also interesting because we were initially, the typical use case that we've seen with MISP was an organization had a MISP instance, they were getting some data in, and they were sharing some data out. But the more people are starting to make use of all the other functionalities in MISP, such as directly feeding their tools and so on, uh, and feeding MISP with their internal uh, automatic collection, the more the need for having a bigger MISP cloud internally came up. And we've seen some organizations that run 60 to 100 MISPs internally in their networks, and one of the issues that they have was, was indeed uh, the management of these MISPs. So if you have 100 MISP instances, first of all, you need to diagnose issues with them, you need to configure them whenever you're spinning up new ones, and you need to do user management that is probably not going to happen in the MISP instances themselves. So we had to expose all of these systems to the APIs and to be able to share all of this information uh, in a simple way. So if, you, if, you're if you're using MISP already and are thinking of use cases like that, you can absolutely do all of that via the API, and you will also get a lot of the feedback now via Zero MQ directly from MISP. So all of the logging and so on now can be stored into a, uh, a single log server, for example, by collecting the uh, uh, the logs directly from all of the MISPs in one shot. Okay. So 
one of the other things that we're, we've been dealing with, uh, with uh, that is a natural issue with information sharing, is language. Uh, we're all uh, coming from different places. Depending on the, cat uh, the country you're from, uh, English uh, literacy might be at a completely different level. If you go to the Netherlands, it's a complete given. Uh, if you're from uh, my neck of the woods, it's not a given at all. So uh, one of the things that we've been seeing uh, recently is organizations are jumping on board of this process. What we've created initially was simply the, uh, the structure to be able to translate everything in a very simplistic way. We have a website where we have all of the translation efforts going on in parallel. Everyone can jump on board and start translating. Uh, and we've seen a lot of uh, contributions from various parties uh, to this effort. So right now, it was originally led by the Japanese. The Japanese language was basically first to reach 100% uh, percent completion. But I hear as of uh, today or, or something close to today, uh, French has caught up and is also at 100% percent completion. And we have other languages slowly progressing towards that goal as well. Uh, so one of the interesting things with this is there are a lot of users out there that are a little bit worried about touching, for example, the, uh, the core of the application and so on. If they want to still contribute, this is a great way of doing it, just going online on the translation page and just translating a sentence or two every now and then, uh, or a phrase or two. And, and, and that's already moving the project a little bit further ahead towards internationalization effort. So, and uh, now we get to the messy parts about the reverse of the internals of MISP. This is something that has been coming for a very long time. We had a lot of different code paths in MISP, uh, basically dealing with the same thing. Over six years, you're, you're bound to come up with basically the same thing over and over in slightly different ways um, uh, whenever you're developing software. So one of the things that we try to do now is basically to cut down of, the, of, these, uh, of these internal functions and send everything through the same pathways whenever you're fetching data uh, from this. So we had a massive consolidation effort for all of the internal APIs, uh, which gave us a lot of advantages. Uh, we have a lot more consistency about uh, how data is being retrieved. Performance-wise, it is great. We have seen massive gains in, say, uh, in some areas uh, uh, on when you're fetching data uh, from your database. Uh, and we've we basically uh, managed to eliminate a lot of the short-sighted designs uh, decisions that we've made years ago when we didn't anticipate some of the different use cases that we have today. For example, one of the things that we didn't anticipate initially when we came up with the tagging system was the fact that, uh, that, that tagging is going to be used really heavily on attribute level. If you look at MISP nowadays, it's a completely natural given that you're going to have about one-to-one -one ratio between the number of tags and attributes in your system, or not actual tags, but tag connections between an object and, uh, and a tag. Uh, this was something we didn't anticipate initially, and the queries were built in a way that, was, that, was, that, that meant that this was basically a massive burden for performance. So things like that have been eliminated over time, uh, especially over the past year. Uh, which also led us to the, uh, to the even bigger rework. If, you, if you've been dealing with integrating MISP, now is a good time to review your integrations. We had a lot of different APIs for extracting data from MISP. So it means if you wanted to get uh, data in CSV format, you had a specific CSV endpoint, which had its own set of parameters, which was completely not compatible, for example, with your Styx export, with your JSON export, and so on. So one of the things that happened very recently was we basically unified all of these APIs. So that means that you have one API endpoint that you can query with a, a, a standardized set of parameters. Uh, and you can request the different export formats that, uh, that you want out of it. This gave us a lot of different advantages that you can use immediately uh, already. So one of the things that we can do is it's very easy to build additional modules directly in MISP uh, to, to enhance it with other uh, translation layers. The other thing is that, that, that these modules now have a standardized way of doing composition. So that means that we, we're no longer restricted on any of our exports to a single event that are coming from the, uh, from the core side of things. For the modules, this is coming up as well. So basically that means that if I want to export uh, a set of events that match a tag uh, in a specific format, I can absolutely do that via the API, or alternatively now via the UI. So if you, we've already had that attribute search in MISP for ages, where you can download the results in two different formats. And one of them was broken, by the way, for the past year, as it turns out. But uh, now, basically, you can use that, uh, the, uh, the UI search to, uh, to find a list of attributes based on the different parameters that you could before. 
and you can export the results in any format that Miss supports, basically. So if you want it, for example, in CSV format or in Suricata rules, whatever, you can get it back directly. So that's half the advantage of that. Uh, the other thing is, and this has always been a hassle, both because the parameter system was a little bit flawed in that it was different from API to API, and also because documentation was lacking, we now have built-in tools that help you build your queries. So until now, we had trainings where we ourselves failed horribly trying to present how, the API, uh, how you're supposed to build those queries because we didn't know it by heart either. Uh, now you have a tool that builds it for you directly. So we have this REST client that is using templating, which means that you can select the endpoint that you want to query, and it will just give you the list of all the possible parameters, tell you which one is mandatory, which one is optional. You just fill out the ones that you want to do, and, it, and you can even directly export that query as a curl query or as a Python script. So that should make your life a lot easier when you're building integrations with your IDS or whatever other tool. Uh, and, and again, this is the, the thing that there's an ongoing effort now which is not complete by any means. We want to self-describe all the APIs. That means we want to be, you to be able to query any of the APIs and ask the API, how, describe yourself, how do we query you, what are the parameters that you're expecting from us. Ah, yeah, the one thing that, <laughs> that we left out, and this is something that we kept forgetting for years and it was kind of stupid we didn't do, is uh, we didn't have a proper way to paginate data via all of these exports. So that means that if you wanted to do the CSV export and you said, I'm interested in everything that has to do with IP addresses, you might have gotten a few million IP addresses thrown back in your face and whatever tool was querying it would crash. So now we have a pagination system. So you can, uh, you can say, I want to get the first 10,000 IP addresses, then the next 10,000, next 10,000. This is standardized across the entire application. We have it described in the RFC already, so we have an RFC now for the query mechanism in MISP. So just, if you want to build tools or integrations, just have a look at that. It should make your life a lot easier compared to what you had before. Okay. So, besides MISP core, we had a lot of reworking were done. There were a lot of internal tools and external tools basically were uh, basically uh, done. Um, thing that has been interesting is PyMISP. PyMISP evolved to kind of next generations. So everything is basically more accessible uh, in a Pythonic way. Uh, basically, everyone is, everything is going into Python 3.6 uh, for very good reasons. Uh, and we try and basically to standardize all parameters uh, between the different API. We had in the past some differences between parameters from PyMISP versus the one from the API. Uh, nowadays, those ones are, are basically uh, the same in PyMISP, which makes the things easier. Uh, what we can now do, do, do with PyMIS, we can even use PyMIS as a kind of lightweight transport mechanism for just the REST request. So, for example, PyMIS could act in two different ways. It can basically do the work for you for creating these events, validating, and so on. But you can ask a specific lax way, where you can basically just pass JSON back and forth. Uh, so, like that, you can even mix, mix up different things like validating events uh, in one way, but on the other one, you, are, you want to be more lax by pushing data into uh, to MISP. So basically, it's a, a massive rework of PyMISP. Uh, in addition to that, we, we extended a lot of things and we did, did a lot of connectors. I'm not mentioning the connector done by uh, external parties, partners, contributors. Those ones are the ones that we basically maintain as Circle. Um, nowadays, mail integration is basically something that we do out of the box. So there's a tool called Mail2MISP that can be used either to collect mail from mailing lists, reporting of people, reporting phishing, and stuff like that. But it can be used for uh, getting, for example, from spam trap, honeypot, and so on, directly the mail into MISP. Uh, it's an interesting tool because this tool can be customized to meet your needs. If you have a specific emails, uh, uh, mechanic, mechanic, uh, mechanism that you get the information from, you can just look at the configuration of mail to MISP. It's really easy to, to configure. Um, some, something else, and we, that's something that we try to work on the, the past uh, months, uh, it's basically to streamline all the tools that we do at Circle. Uh, to basically use the complete set of uh, modules and information that we have within this project. For example, we try to normalize all our working in incident response and so on back on existing taxonomies. Uh, we try to basically actively reusing our galaxies at all tools. And for example, we have this uh, tools called Analysis Information Leak, which is another open source tool, uh, which is used for finding leaks into unstructured data sources like uh, dark web, uh, paste bin, whatever, uh, you, you name it. Uh, but the idea being is basically the L integration is commonly streamlined with MISP. So if you get a detection for a credit card numbers, you can 
get it back into your MIS automatically and notify your constituent. Um, so we try to basically improve this, those uh, connectors. Uh, we do the same with various projects that we have. Uh, we have some plan with uh, URL abuse. We have some plan with BGP ranking and so on. So all the tools that we develop, we try to integrate those uh, into the, the thing with, with MISP. Oh, sticks. So sticks is for Mr. Sticks, I think. So, yeah, um, a quick review of all the features we have between uh, MISP and sticks. So, um, before I started working for Circle, um, MISP was already supporting Styx 1.1 export. So, uh, so I simply improved it. And no, during all this year, I've been working a lot of Styx 2 as well. Styx, uh, especially, uh, um, the export first. Um, so we have, uh, Styx. Uh, files that can be generated from the uh, MISP UI, as well as uh, sticks data from the REST search, as Andras uh, mentioned it. Um, <coughs> a big um, part of the work, as well, is the import of sticks data uh, for both versions. Uh, I did not mention, uh, yeah, the automation part. Um, we can export multiple events in one sticks file, six one, six two, whatever. Uh, on the other side, the sticks import only support, uh, single files import one by one. Then you have one event with the uh, whatever I can Map. She's <laughs> sometimes a bit tough. I sh I must have say. <laughs> so um, what can be mapped? So from MISP, actually, um, I try to map to map uh, as many things as we can that can be relevant to export and that will still has the same meaning in sticks. So lots of our um, uh, objects, lots of our yeah, uh, uh, types of data we have as uh, attributes, objects, galaxies as well, uh, represented in events are uh, thus exported <coughs> And on the other part, uh, it's a bit more, it's a bit more difficult because <laughs> uh, I tried to support as many sticks objects as I, as I could, mapping indicators, observed data, threat actors, and so on, uh, is supported right now. Uh, I'm still, we're still trying to map more and more stuff, more and more, uh, yeah, samples. Um, <clears throat> so this was, yeah, to say that we, we still have, a, we still have some limitations on those features because of the differences on two, on the two formats. Uh, one of our, one of the main feature to come is to use the sticks enhancement proposals to fix some, um, mapping, uh, issues we have. Because right now, a lot of MISP objects are exported as custom objects. And, uh, on the other side, a lot of uh, sticks objects are simply not supported because we, 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 we don't know, we don't have any samples. And the, the other problem which is really annoying for us is the con 
contextualization loss. For instance, we have um, objects uh, in our format with lots of attributes, and each one each one of them have UIDs, for example. Each one of them could have galaxies and so on. And the UID is uh, is lost then because in Stix format you only have one UID for the complete object. So th there's a lot of uh, little problems like this. We hope we will uh, fix with the, with those uh, enhancements and so on. But uh, what we what we <laughs> what we would be really glad to have is some more samples. So especially from especially um, external files to import, so we can uh, feel the, the mapping and so on, and support more. Just a side note regarding Stick's uh, enhancement proposal. Uh, where it's coming from, it's coming from, from the OASIS uh, technical committee. Um, so it's not coming from nowhere. Uh, they discover that basically they have a fundamental problem. A lot of vendors are using custom objects. So they basically just, you have the standard and then you have everyone putting into custom object. So, you know, it's like the X headers in HTTP. So basically everyone is putting information there. Um, so the thing is, uh, when we saw that proposal and this proposal was done by Trey Darley and this one was quite good. I mean, the idea behind is basically to, to have a, I would say a door to create new, uh, new, uh, standard or at least new extension that you properly describe, including the JSON schema and the validations, which is very interesting. And that's the thing that um, we were interested in because like that we can move away from custom object for all the things that we could not describe in MISP and basically just use those JSON schema and just map them into our own JSON schema. Uh, so it's it's an ongoing uh, process into the TC. Uh, it might take time on their side, uh, but we, we are really there to push uh, for that direction. Maybe you want to add something? Yeah. Basically, uh, to just recap the subtext here, uh, basically, uh, we're all running into issues when we're converting right now to Stix format. And I'm sure that vendors are running into the same issue. Other tools are running into the same issue. Everyone is creating custom objects because of this. So what we're trying to do is let's band together as uh, tool producers, uh, vendors, uh, and so on, and let's, custom, uh, and let's standardize on these custom objects together. And this is where steps are becoming interesting. So... Uh, this is a way, way for us basically to not have a, a two-year waiting period for something new to show up in the Stix format proper. We can basically standardize uh, on it in a much more rapid way. The thing is that, and this is something we've seen in MISP as well, was very often we get new needs overnight basically to be able to share something. And when that happens, we cannot wait that long of a period to do it. We've seen, for example, in Stix 1, it was an interesting case, where we've seen some organizations basically share... Uh, mule account and fraud information via mutexes because the organization had no capabilities to use mutexes. They figured, whoa, that's a great vehicle for us to, uh, to share that with our partners. We want to avoid this situation and we want to be able to basically create proper custom objects that we can centralize on. And, and if you are a vendor, provide us some samples. That would be cool, especially for this guy. Oh, this one is interesting. Um, the and I think uh, it's a, a long, long discussion. And I think uh, on the long term, we, we have seen that I think we are I think, basically right on that. Um, we really think that every tools and every kind of use case and so on needs specific format. And those formats, for example, are different than the one that you use for uh, doing the transport or doing the storage of the intelligence and so on. And um, we really think that you need to have a Yara uh, format for uh, doing binary analysis and, and finding binary strings and so on. Uh, it's the same for Sigma, which is a great format for, for example, describing things like uh, what I want to query in my CM and stuff like that. So you have this kind of meta format. Uh, you have genes, for example, uh, which is an interesting one for a VTX file, where you can create kind of Yara rules into your logs too. Uh, 6 2 patterning is another way of, of doing meta formatting. And we really think that basically... Um, you should not force people to use a single format, but basically to open your systems to use different formats depending on what is the output, what is the use case, and so on. 
maybe something to add here is uh, basically we've seen different approaches from different tools and from different organizations that you talk to or different people in that case, for that matter. Uh, the question is whether we should uh, feed our tools directly via the, uh, 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 the language that the tool understands natively, whether we should feed it with, with a meta language uh, or not a meta language, a sharing language like MISP zone format, sticks is on, sticks to, and so on. Uh, and uh, we were already uh, from the start uh, firm believers of going as native as possible, but this gave us some hurdles with basically being able to uh, to reach as many different tools as possible out there. So if we, for example, were to share finely crafted Suricata rules, an IDS that is not uh, understanding Suricata will have issues with that. So one of the things that popped up recently, and this is absolutely fantastic what we've seen from these, are these meta formats that are already limited in scope uh, to whatever is needed by the type of tool that basically understands that meta format or, or what will convert the data to that, uh, from that meta format. And uh, recently we put more effort into basically uh, using these meta formats to feed specific tools. So for example, if I'm going to uh, feed an IDS, I don't necessarily need to have uh, certain pieces or uh, data points uh, in the data package that I'm sending to it that have nothing to do with what an IDS does. So this is already a pre-filter basically by converting to one of these meta formats, which we've seen had great results so far. So what we do right now is very simple. We carry rules as is. That means if you generate a uh, Sigma rule, we don't try to decompile it and basically do something with it and then generate something, uh, something else out of it, because in many cases this will not work. Uh, we will never have the accuracy in our own format to be able to describe the compositions that, for example, Sigma, Yara, uh, or, or, or 62 patterns for that matter do, and we don't try to do that. Instead, what we try to do is to carry this data as is and to en uh, enhance this data with additional rules that we generate out of the data that we have. Uh, another thing that we do rec as of recently is we have modules to validate the, uh, the, uh, the various rules that are produced out there. Are they valid or are they going to crash your system when you're uh, ingesting the data on the other side? And the other thing that we do is we use the, uh, the converters that are out there to basically take the data in these meta formats and generate the various rules out of it on the fly. So Christian has developed a nice little module for it, which basically allows you to just say, okay, here's a Sigma rule. Uh, uh, use an open source converter for it in the background and generate the various rules in the various formats out of it, even something as simple as grab rules. Uh, so it's it's really a, a great and easy way to move forward with this. And um, we did some work and this one was a significant one because I think it was not one of the first integration in the TI platform for Go AML. Uh, so <laughs> this one was a, a Kind of interesting uh, work because it was basically the conversion into the anti-money laundering format uh, from MISP. So that means you had to create objects. So it was a good exercise for us to basically map uh, all the MISP objects, so seeing the which one were missing, uh, to have basically a full chain of integration in MISP for uh, fraud management, especially in the financial sectors. So it's something that we worked on. Uh, this one is as a MISP module. It's a good example of if you want to su support a legacy format or a legacy system that you have, uh, to export it into a different format. So if you look at the code of GoML, it's quite clean. Uh, it's a mismodule, so it's extensions. L like for the validity of rules and conversion from six Sigma, it's just uh, mismodules as uh, standard extensions. So another thing that uh, we, we did a lot of work is basically the contextualization aspect. Um, what we have seen initially, for example, we, we had this, this aspect in MISP where you could attach galaxies into an event at an event level. Then we discover that people say, yeah, it's nice, but you know, we need contextualization on, 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 on the attribute part and so on. And then we started to basically add more and more functionality into MISP to basically being able to add contextualize at more granular level. So at the attribute level and so on. Um, um, the thing is, uh, the galaxy itself are, are basically in constant rework. Uh, significant work has been done into the metadata. So there's a kind of flexible way to basically describe a lot of things in, in the galaxies. But we try to normalize some of the keys used in the metadata. Um, for example, for the trade actor, we have a significant list of keywords that we use for the uh, metadata. Um, but it's, it's very interesting because like that, people can start to share more information about uh, trade intelligence and so on in addition to that. Um, then we had 
New galaxies that we had, like vulnerabilities, we had a specific one from Banker for sector of activities. Um, what we try to do too is, um, even if the galaxies have all the same format, they might have a different way of representations. And uh, that's Andres was mentioning about attack. We basically really embrace MITRE attack on the UI level. So basically, it's exactly the same as the backend. But in the front end, we basically use a kind of MITRE navigator. So it's basically the same way of look, look and feel and so on. Um, so it's easier for the end user to basically find back and, and to have the same look and feel on, on, on different applications. Um, and that we can do it is not only attack. I mean, for any galaxy, we can do it. But right now, we do it for MITRE uh, attack. But if you have a different model with different representations, uh, we can improve that on, on the uh, on the UI. I think that we um, uh, did some some uh, some work too. Is basically the, the backend right now are including a way to interlink clusters, so you basically can make relationship uh, sp specifying a specific tax and so on between uh, different uh, different clusters. Um, it's right now in the in the in the backend data and so on, but it will be in the UI of, of MISP uh, quite soon. Um, thing that we, we wanted to do too is basically we have seen that we have more and more informations, uh, and one of the tools that we developed, which was basically just a test case for the zero MQ at the early beginning, uh, become a complete application by, by itself. Uh, there is already as a kind of second version, uh, uh, Sami that is working on the dashboard is working on a third version of it, uh, which uh, include more uh, flexibility regarding the setup of the dashboard itself. You can even share dashboard format and stuff like that. So it's it's really going in, in a nice directions. But it's really a tool for gathering information from different MISP instances. Uh, we did some work with, for example, uh, some exercises, so cybersecurity exercises, where they wanted to have like kind of of quick glance of what's going on, and we started to use the dashboard for such kind of things. And then we use the dashboard internally for more situational awareness. Uh, so it's really one one of the things is, is basically to leverage all the data that you have in your different MISP into a single point, and you have a quick look at what's going on. Um, thing that we have seen too is, is basically all the information there when you add more context. By adding context, you basically can start to have trending aspect. You can see all the information is evolving and you can even sometimes maybe even take decision on it. Uh, for example, if you have more, for example, MITRE attack uh, techniques that are set on attribute level or even level, you start to see the most commonly used techniques. And by doing that, you can start to share this information and you can even set a kind of threshold of the thing that you really need to fix before that you can work. Uh, for example, if you have one of the techniques from MITRE attack that is basically appearing everywhere, but you don't have any uh, defensive measures against it, maybe you have to work on that. So when you do the contextualizations, you can start to derivate more information of the, or, or out of this kind of information. Um, this one was a kind of, of uh, long-term project that we have about what we call gamification of the information sharing, where we want that people get an incentive to share more information. Um, so the dashboard itself uh, has an interesting one where you can basically see competitions and you can see scores uh, and so on of the different organizations. Uh, but the idea behind is basically to go a bit even further, uh, kind of opt-in mechanism in MISP and to integrate it as a part of the platform in the long run. Um, additional information coming into the system. So we had this zero MQ subsystem which start to be more and more used. Um, so nowadays people are using it for auditing, for situational awareness, for other things, so they can build their own tools around the zero MQs. Um, and for example, we always talk about notifications uh, capabilities in MISP. That's maybe one of the uh, options that you have to, to basically have quick notification and so on. Uh, and then we try to have those building statistics in MISP. Um, one of the things that we are looking at, and maybe something that we will talk on Friday with the attack workshop, uh, it's to share back those analytics. So, as now you have plenty of people using MISP, that's great, but they need to share back not only the data itself, but maybe statistics or analytics. So it's maybe a, a complement that we will integrate into MISP at some point. Um, things that has been done, and I think there were a lot of, of work on that, and I think it's basically an effect of the object. Um, at the early beginning, uh, miss like what kind of flat list of indicators and so on. When we started to introduce objects, we introduced relationship between object and object, or between object and attributes. But more you do relationships, you create object and so on, it starts to be very difficult for an analyst to figure out 
what we are talking about and so on. No, that's why we have this uh, event graph view in MISP, where you can basically view the complete uh, event uh, with uh, all the relationship, all the different objects and so on. And the nice thing for that interface, you can basically do everything that you do from the UI, uh, which is the event view or directly, you can do it from the graph view. And that's, that's quite cool because we have seen that some users are basically used to create uh, raw data from the user interface, but some prefer to use the graph relationship views. Uh, and both are basically interchangeable, so you can use one and use the other as, as you wish. Uh, there are some new functionality there. You can even store a state of a graph. So you, if you, for example, set up a complete nice graph of the correlation, uh, of not the correlation, but the, uh, the relationship between the different objects and so on, uh, you can basically start to save it and you can even share it back and export the graph uh, and so on. So there are a lot of functionality there. Um, we plan to expand it into the expansion services, the MIS modules, and so on. Uh, so there are some crazy ideas there. So, uh, and there are some other graphs that we plan to implement in MISP in the future for other functionalities. Yep. One of the things that uh, that we also be trying to, to do over the past few months, and we have someone that is basically working, putting a pretty crazy amount of time into. Uh, Strengthening this aspect is basically the way that we do deployments of MISP. So one of the things that has seen a lot of love recently is the auto build script. So uh, we're, we're being a bit more clever with uh, with with how we're building uh, a new MISP machine from uh, from scratch with the script. So ranging from uh, not generating hard coded credentials for a for a test system and so on. Uh, to, some, to basically including more of the subsystems that by default we did not come with automatically generated MISPs. So this also translates into the VMs being be uh, being much more better equipped. Uh, if you run one of the older VMs, basically you got something uh, very sim basic and simplistic where you had a basic MISP running with some default credentials and nothing else in it. Nowadays, we pre-configure the MISP with a lot of, uh, of data, a lot of other additional services, and run a lot of other tools that are compatible with MISP by default in the VM. So that's one of the big changes there. Uh, so there, uh, there has been also a lot of effort from the community to basically build uh, deployment tools for their various different uh, environments, which has been contributed back to the open source. Some of those are, uh, have uh, seen a lot of love. So one of uh, one of those is basically two uh, Docker uh, versions of uh, of uh, MISP that, uh, that are out there. So uh, one is maintained by Xavier Mattens and the other by Harvard IT Security. Both take very different approaches, and both have pretty large uh, uh, fan bases. Uh, so by all means, uh, if you don't want to go through the hassle of uh, installing in a host, or if you want to run a Docker environment, you now have two great options to go with. So we'll just have a look at those. Same thing for Red Hat and CentOS. If you don't want to go through a standard install options, there is now an RPM available that was contributed by uh, Switch. Uh, <clears throat> so have a look at that. Uh, that should get you up and going within a few moments, basically, once... Uh, Ah, yes, we're missing Ansible. So we, we also have uh, Ansible playbooks, basically, to, ins uh, uh, to install MISP. What are we missing from this list? Other than that, uh, there's also a Vagrant in, uh, installer, indeed, as well. Uh, as well as there are various tools that have been developed, uh, contributed for cloud deployments. For example, Amazon S3 integration, uh, and so on. So uh, there's also, I don't know if that is public, there was also an effort to... Uh, to cluster MISP internally across uh, several uh, SQL installations and with uh, load balancing and so on. I don't know how much of that is public, but if not, we'll probably have to make something public ourselves. <laughs> so that is also one of the big questions that comes up very often. So that's basically for this. Yeah, and if you want to do it, uh, Okay, so um, last year we, we talked about the uh, standardization process for, for MISP. So what we, we decided for, for the past year is basically to publish as much as we can regarding the standardizations and all the format that we do. Um, one of the things, for example, is uh, uh, we took a different approach and it's not a common approach of standardizations. It's only based on uh, the implementation. So we basically set implementations and the implementation is the origin of the standard. So we already published uh, four internet drafts. One is a core exchange format, which is the most well-known one used for the MISP format itself. 
then we have one that are describing the galaxy format, so how to describe galaxy, the one for the object templates, and the one for the taxonomy format. Um, there is an, an ongoing internet draft for the, to normalize the query rest format, so that means we would like to even normalize uh, the query format, so even other implementations could even have a compatible REST API, uh, which is not MISP, but could be something else. Uh, so the idea behind is like that if you write a tool for MISP, it would work with other tools. Uh, so that's the, uh, I would say, uh, crazy goal behind. Um, but we get a lot of feedback on the uh, on the standard because it was kind of a source for a lot of implementations to uh, see how the format is described and so on. They tend to be quite simple, so we don't want to be very large and complex format, and we try to separate those. So those are completely independent from each other, uh, but they can re be reused all together in a specific application and so on. Yeah. So um, going a bit in the object uh, aspect and the standardizations, um, so the past year we started with the object templating and so on. Nowadays we have 83 MISP object templates. Um, so what we have seen is at the beginning, not everyone was using object, but I think nowadays every new event that we get contains at least one object. Uh, so uh, those templates are basically just definition of how you express a specific object together. Um, we have seen interesting use cases where communities were starting to use their own custom templates, and that was the goal. The goal of the MISP object was basically everyone can build their own data models, start to share information around it, and so on. And that was the idea behind it. Um, so we started to have more and more contributions. Um, we are currently working on, on, on a huge set of forensic object templates for the uh, for all the forensic tools. Um, so, for example, for the one doing forensics, you know, regrippers, uh, the Python VTX parser, and so on, the VTX parser. The idea behind is basically to import that into MISP. Uh, there are some ongoing tools and so on that are uh, being extended into MISP, but uh, the idea behind is to do more sharing on forensic evidences and so on within MISP and do some collaborative action and so on. We are really interested in new use case. I mean, uh, every day I see people popping up with new pull requests for objects and so on. Uh, it's always needed, even if it looks similar or synonym of an existing template, even doing a pull request is useful. It's not because we will integrate the template as this, but we can reuse maybe an existing, existing template and fix others. So uh, if you have an other idea, other use case of sharing information and you need to have this kind of complex uh, object and so on, just propose. If you cannot write your own template, it's fine too. Uh, you can create an issue uh, and we can discuss uh, all together about the uh, definition models and so on. Uh, the object template is, is very simple. Uh, it's not nested, but you have a list of relationships that are defined by default and you can really create a lot of things based on object data models. And then this one is a typo and should not be there. That's great. Okay, that's perfect. So that was the closing part. So, yes. so we had two times the sticks aspects. Uh, we love so much sticks, that's why we put it two times. <laughs> okay, is there any question regarding what we did in the past year? Uh, the same, uh, not necessarily, but we do have some. Uh, oh, okay, yes. Uh, so, so the question was uh, um, that we, that we've done a lot of work on uh, on the deployment part, but uh, whether we, we can reuse or whether we have some tools for the backup aspect uh, and, and the migration aspect of the, of the whole thing. Um, yes, we we have some tools for that specifically. So we have a backup tool in, in MISP that uh, that you can uh, that will basically gather all the data. That you need to be able to get up and running on a new instance, and you can do the same, uh, use the same one for migration. So what it will do is it will harvest all the data from your databases. It will collect all your file samples, all your organization logos, everything from disk, uh, and just compile it into a zip file that you can then move over to a different uh, server and then get going from that again. And you can even use um, local synchronizations if you want to replicate just data without having those decrement of, of sharing groups and stuff like that. Uh, it's another way, it's just to back up a part of the data, but at least it's a way to synchronize a large set of instance. Uh, 
that's an ongoing work. Yeah. Uh, so we, no, we need to, we have an import modules for. I thought you did. <laughs> so have you seen the nice way as to basically have new contributors? <laughs> Okay, so we are, I think, just on time. Perfect. Um, okay.